Hi, let's have class. Let's talk about the adversarial attack. What is the adversarial attack? In the homework. We have trained a lot of neural networks. Of course, we expect that these models can be used for real applications. However, to apply these neural networks for real life, a model that achieves high accuracy is not enough. It is still far from real applications. So, what else do we need? We need our model to be able to defend against hostility. What is the so-called hostility? Consider a network that is made to detect malicious behavior. Since it is for malicious behavior detection, whoever is involved will try to spoof the network. It is not enough. If a network achieves high accuracy in normal conditions, it also needs to achieve high accuracy when someone tries to deceive it. For example, we use neural networks for spam filtering nowadays. The network judges whether an email is spam or not. For spammers, they also try to keep their spams from being classified as spam. Someone may modify the content in the mail and attempt to deceive the network. Is the network robust to these modifications? We thus want the neural network to defend against human hostility in addition to achieving high accuracy. For example, he is the king of the chimera ants, and his name is Meruem. He is superior to any other creatures in the world. He is very strong, and humans cannot defeat him. He attempted to exterminate all the humans. However, humans did not fight against it directly. Humans discarded their self-esteem. They just deployed an atom bomb to kill him. That is the end of the story. So, what does this tell us? It tells us that it is not enough for a network to achieve high accuracy. It must defend against human hostility. Okay, now let's see what human hostility may be like. We start from a real case. We have trained a lot of models for image classification in the homework. Given an image, a classification model tells which class it belongs to. Now we can apply some noise. A noise that is really small. An image can be considered a very long vector. And we can introduce some little noise to every dimension of the vector. Then we input this noise added image to the network and observe what happens. Generally, this noise is quite small. It is too small that humans are not aware of it. The noise added in this example is actually too large. The noise should be so small that it is human imperceptible. The image with noise are called attacked images. As for the original image, we call them the benign image. It's a good image that has not been attacked. We feed the benign image into network, and the network prediction is a cat. Then we anticipate that the attacked image, which is perturbed by the bad guys, can make the model prediction differ. The attack can be roughly divided into two types. One is the targetless attack. The targetless attack only aims to make the prediction of the model something except a cat. Apart from the targetless attack, there is another more challenging attack, which is the targeted attack. In other words, we not only want the output of the model as not a cat, but also is the desired class. For example, we hope that after adding noise, the model prediction becomes a starfish. The model misjudged the cat as a starfish. So we considered it a successful attack. Okay, is it really possible to make the targeted attack? Is it possible to add human imperceptible noise to make the output of the model different? It is actually possible. The model here is not a very weak network. It is a 50 layered res net. We feed the benign image that is not attacked into the 50 layered res net. The model prediction is a tiger cat. Do you know image recognition systems nowadays can tell you what the animal is and tell you its species? After you input this image into the model, the model predicts not merely a cat, but a tiger cat. However, it is said that the cat is actually not a tiger cat. It doesn't matter. Anyway, we can recognize that it is a cat. At least, we can know that it belongs to the cat family. Okay, there is a confidence score. The confidence score here is 0.64. What does this confidence score mean? This confidence score is the result after performing softmax. 
Suppose your image classification has 2000 categories. There will be 2000 scores corresponding to the 2000 categories. The score must be between 0 and 1. And the summarization of the 2000 scores should be 1. We can see that the Tiger Cat gets a score of 0.64. Among 2000 categories. It's actually quite high. Followingly, we add some noise to this benign image. Now we want to attack this image so that the prediction of the model becomes a starfish. Then the attacked image looks like this. You wonder where the noises are. Actually, the noises are added. However, they are so small that they are human imperceptible. What will happen if we feed this image into ResNet? The output of ResNet becomes starfish with a confidence score of 100%. Initially, ResNet was not so sure if it was a cat. But now the model is 100% sure that it is a starfish. In order to prove, there are still some differences between these two images. Let's subtract one from another. Besides, after subtraction, we also enlarge the difference by 50 times. The result will look like this. So these two photos are indeed different. I didn't copy the same image twice to lie to you. Although they are a little different, people can't tell what impact the difference will make. However, the outputs of the ResNet are very different for the two images. You might think that there is possibly a special relationship between cats and starfishes. Thus make it a special case. Yet, it is not a special case. You can easily turn this cat into anything. I can simply add another noise to make this cat a keyboard. And the confidence score is as high as 0.98. Initially, the model wasn't so certain if it was a cat. After adding another noise, the model is 98% sure it is a keyboard. Again, you might think that. How can such an outrageous behavior happen? Maybe the model is just poor. However, there are 50 layers for ResNet. So it's not a bad network at all. Assume that only common noise was added. The model doesn't necessarily make mistakes. Here we have the original image. We add noise to the image, which is human aware. Apparently, you can see that the noise has been added to the image. For this image, ResNet classifies it as a tabby cat. This may be the correct answer. Anyway, the model knows it is a cat. Adding more noise. Now the model classifies it as a Persian cat. This might do to the increasing noise making. This cat look fluffy. So ResNet thinks it saw a Persian cat. Keep increasing the noise. Now you may no longer know what the image is. For this image, ResNet classifies it as a fire screen. What is a fire screen? I googled it. And a fire screen looks like this. Hence, you can fully understand why the model makes a wrong prediction. It considers the noise we added to be the screen. And the orange cat in the back to be the flame. Although the model makes a wrong prediction. It still has a point here. However, when adding a noise that is human unaware, the model output a result that doesn't make sense. In the following section, before we talk about why it happens, let's first take a look at the attack mentioned above and how to do it. How did we add a very small noise to make the network predict a wrong result? This is our network. This is a function called f. This function takes an image as input which is called x0, and output the prediction result of the classification. The prediction result is called y0. Then we assume that the parameters of the network here are fixed. We will not discuss the network parameters here. They are not the key points today. Just keep in mind that they are fixed. When performing the non-targeted attack, how can we find out the noise? The goal is to get a new image, which is denoted as x. Then the network f output y when given the input x. Then correct label of the input x as y hat. We hope that the bigger the gap between y and y hat, the better. That is the non-targeted attack. It is a non-target attack. We only need to know that the correct label is y hat. We just have to make the network's output and the correct answer differ. Then, the attack has succeeded. How to do it? How to find an x? such that the output y has a large gap with y hat? We also have to solve an optimization problem. This resembles training a network as we did. 
Let's first define a loss function. This loss function is called L. What is this L? This L is the difference between Y and Y hat with a minus sign. For example, we usually utilize entropy loss when training a classification model. As for the minus E of Y and Y hat, it represents the cross entropy between Y and Y hat. However, we want to maximize the cross entropy. Accordingly, we put a negative sign in front of cross entropy. Then this negative cross entropy is our loss. And we minimize this loss. We hope to find an x. So as to minimize the L of x. The smaller L of x is. The bigger cross entropy between y and y hat. That is, the greater the distance between y and y hat. This is a non-target attack. If it is a targeted attack. Then we will set our goal first. We use y target to represent our attacking target. The y hat is actually a one hot vector. And the y target is also a one hot vector. Then we now hope that y will be not only different from y hat. But also be close to y target. Suppose your y target is a fish. Then the desired y should. Have a low score on the cat. And a high score on the fish. Then, your loss function is written like this. Our loss function is the cross entropy of negative y and y head you hope it the bigger the better but at the same time you want the cross entropy of y and y target the smaller the better you sum up these two together to get your loss you want to find an x to minimize this loss but just finding an x to minimize the loss is not enough because we actually expect the fewer noises we add the better that is to say, we hope our newly found picture, which could deceive the network, is as close to the original picture as possible. X and X0 should be as close as possible. So, when we solve this problem of optimization, we add one more restriction, which is D of X0, X, less than or equal to sigma. Then, what does this D of X0, X, less than or equal to sigma mean? It means that we hope that the difference between x and x0 is less than a certain threshold. It is less than a certain threshold. What is the threshold based on? It is usually based on human perceptive ability. We assume that if the difference between x and x0 is greater than d of x0 x, then it represents the difference between the two. Just wait a moment. In the next slide, I will talk about how to calculate the difference between two pictures. If the difference between x0 and x is greater than sigma, we assume that people will see this noise and find out that there is a noise. So, we have to make the difference between x0 and x less than or equal to sigma. We have to make it less than or equal to the limit that humans can perceive. Then, we could generate a picture which humans look no difference between x and x0. But, the result it generates is very different for network. Okay, how do we calculate the difference between x and x0? How do we calculate the distance between them? D of x0, x represents the distance between them. There are different algorithms for it. For the convenience of using symbols, we assume that x is a vector. Since it is a picture, it is a vector. x0 is another picture. It is also a vector. The subtraction of these two vectors is called delta x. About the distance, you can use L2 norm as their distance. In other words, you can calculate the L2 norm of delta x, which is square the first place of this delta x, square the second place, and square the third place. In fact, you can even square root them here. It depends on your definition of L2 norm. You can square root them. Okay, there is another definition, which is L infinity. What is L infinity? It is taking this delta x, seeing which dimension has the largest absolute value, and that one is L infinity. We take delta x1, delta x2, and delta x3, which are every dimension of delta x to see their absolute values. To find the largest one, the largest one represents the distance between x and x0. Okay, there are many different ways 
to calculate the distance between two pictures. But when we are deciding which method to use to calculate the distance between pictures, we should take human perception into account. Which is a better distance? During an attack, L2 or L infinity? Let me give you an example to explain. Okay, this is a picture. Suppose this picture only has four pixels. Now, we made two different changes to this picture. The first one is to make very small changes to the color of these four pixels. The second one is to only alter the color of the pixel. In the lower right corner, the change is also relatively larger. If we were to calculate the L2 norm of these two pictures, it would be the same as the L2 norm of these two pictures. The picture above is the result of altering all four pixels of the picture below. The middle picture is the picture below. The picture below is the result of altering only the pixel in the lower right corner of the picture in the middle. This change is relatively larger. The L2 norm of these two changes is the same. But if you look at L infinity, they are not the same. Because L infinity only cares about the largest change. For L infinity, it looks at the largest amount of change here, and the largest amount of change here. The biggest change at the bottom scenario is greater than the biggest change at the top scenario. So if you look at L infinity and L2 from this example, which is closer to human perception? Maybe it should be L infinity. Because for you, these two pictures, I believe most of you may not be able to tell the difference between them. I can guarantee you that there is a difference between the two. They have very, very slight differences. It's just that the difference is distributed on each pixel. As for the bottom scenario, you can clearly see the green in the lower right corner is darkened. Although the colors of these three pixels are fixed, when the color in the lower right corner becomes darker, you immediately find that there are changes in the picture. You can tell that this picture has been modified. So it seems that L infinity may be more in line with actual needs. If we want to avoid if we want to avoid being perceived by a human, a small L2 is not enough. We want to make L infinity the smaller, the better, to make it less likely to be perceived. So in the homework, we use L infinity as our restriction, as the attack. Our homework is to attack the image produced by the image recognition system. On Judge Boy, we will put limits on the gap between the new pictures and the original benign picture. The gap should be less than a certain threshold. When we were setting this gap, we chose to use L infinity. In reality, how the distance should be chosen also depends on the domain knowledge. The example we just gave was about images. If the attack was targeted at a voice-related system, X and X0 would be audio signals. Audio signals that sound distant to a human won't necessarily be judged from L2 and L infinity. You would have to study the auditory system of a human and see what kind of changes humans are particularly sensitive to. Then, design the method of measuring the distance between x and x0. According to that, so, domain knowledge is needed in that part. Now we have the optimization problem. What we have to do is minimize the loss. We are looking for an x to minimize this loss. However, there are some limitations on x. The distance between x and x0 must be less than or equal to x. How do we solve this problem? Let's ignore this restriction first. If there are no restrictions, can we solve this problem? Well, we actually know how to solve that. As it's no different from training a normal model. In our first class, I showed this optimization question to you and told you that we could minimize the loss by tuning the parameters of the network. Now, we're simply replacing the parameters with the input. That's it. Just treat the input image as part of the network parameters and minimize the loss, then we're done. Now that the parameters of the network are fixed, we only need to adjust the input to minimize the loss. That's all. We're still using gradient descent. How exactly do we do it? We need to have an initialization first. The target we are looking for now is x, the input image not the network parameter. Still, it needs an initial value, right? We still need an initial value. When doing gradient descent, 
What kind of value is better for the initial value? You might not start with a random image. Instead, you might start with x0, since we want the newly found x to be as close to x0 as possible. Why not start searching from x0? If we start looking from x0, the x you find next may be closer to x0. So, we should initialize the value of x to x0. After that, it's pretty much the same as the normal gradient descent. We update the parameters iteratively. For example, we set the iteration, t, to start from 1 and go up to t. Then, we calculate the gradient. In every iteration, it's just that it's not the gradient of the network parameters with regard to the loss. We're now focusing on the gradient of the input image. With regard to the loss, the input x is a very long vector. Let's call its elements x1, x2, x3, etc. Given the image or the vector, Calculate the partial derivative of L with respect to all the variables at these points. For example, calculate the partial derivative of L with respect to x1 and a partial L with respect to x2, and you end up with a gradient. Use the gradient to update with the image. That's it. So you multiply the gradient with the learning rate and subtract this product from the image x0. This is exactly the same as the original gradient descent method. The only difference is that we are doing gradient descent with respect to the input, not the parameters. Everything else is the same. We have a learning rate. We multiply it with the gradient, subtract the product from the original image, and get a new image. You can run this method iteratively, just as you did in normal gradient descent. But this is under the premise that there are no constraints. Now we have to add the constraints back. When we did gradient descent before, we didn't impose any kind of constraint on the parameters. We didn't set limits on the parameters. Now we need to impose the constraint that the difference between x0 and x must be less than or equal to epsilon. How can we deal with this problem? We will add a module into the gradient descent procedure. Oh, it's almost 520. We need to end at 520. We might need to stop. After I finish talking about the most important things. So we are trying to run gradient descent. But we should also take account of the difference between x0 and x. How can we achieve this? The answer is. Very easy. Actually kind of worthless. After you finished updating the parameters. And discovered that x0 and x. Sorry, I mean xt. If you finished updating the parameters. And discovered that. The difference between xt and x0 is greater than epsilon. Just modify xt directly to satisfy the constraints. For example, suppose we are using L infinity and x0 is right here. Then x can only lie in this square, right? Because L infinity considers the biggest difference between x0 and x. So the difference will exceed epsilon outside of this square. Therefore, it should lie in this range. After gradient descent. How do we ensure that? It falls in this area? Simply pull it back. If it went out of the area. After updating. So, if you get the blue point. And find it out of the box after this step. What should we do? Find a position in the box that is closest to the blue point. And then pull the blue point in. Done. It's over. This kind of attack has many different variants. You can find various attack methods in the literature, but in fact, they are all spirited by what we will talk about today. The differences between them are the constraints or the optimization methods, but gradient descent is still used. Their spirit is still the same. It's just that you may have a different optimizer here. You may have different restrictions here. It becomes a different attack method, but they are all spirited by the example we gave you today. Okay, let's introduce one of the easiest methods of attack. This should be the method that can pass the medium baseline. What is this method? This method is called FGSM. Can it pass the medium baseline? Oh, it can't pass the medium baseline. It can only pass the simple baseline. Okay, how does this FGSM work? Very simple. Its full name is fast gradient sign method. How does it do? It's like the one punch man. It only takes one hit. 
Normally, when you are doing gradient descent, you have to update parameters many times. But what makes FGSM powerful is that it decides to update the parameters only once and see if you can kill with one hit. Find an image that can attack successfully in one hit. So, first of all, it was supposed to iteratively update parameters, but now it has changed. We only do one attack. We only do one attack. For G, it made a special design. As for why this special design was made, you can go and look at the original document to understand why there is such an idea at the beginning. It says we don't use gradient descent value directly. We give it a sign. What does this sign mean? This sign means if the value in the brackets is greater than zero, the output is one. If the value in the brackets is less than zero, the output is negative one. So after adding a sign, the element in vector g is either one or negative one. Originally, if you used gradient, its value can be any real number. But now, we apply the sign function. Either it is one or negative one. So g is always one or negative one. What about the learning rate? The learning rate is assumed to be epsilon. It depends on how big this epsilon is on your side. Here, the learning rate is set exactly the same. What effect will you get if you set it exactly the same? The effect will be like this. After you attack, you must fall on the four corners of this blue frame. Because you think about it, this g is either 1 or negative 1. Each dimension of it is either 1 or negative 1. Then the front of it will be multiplied by epsilon. So after multiplying epsilon, your x0 today may move epsilon steps to the right, or move epsilon steps to the left, or move up epsilon steps, or move down epsilon steps. So after making an attack today, after your x0 has made an attack, it will definitely move to the four corners of this square. It must be one of these four corners. Just do this. You can always pass if you just do this. So you can use it to pass the simple baseline. Then some classmates will ask what's the benefit of killing with one blow. If I attack a few more times, wouldn't it be better after a few more iterations? It will be better. So you run a few more iterations. Then you pass the medium baseline, that's it. Okay, so how do I run more iterations? You run an iteration originally. Now you just run a few more iterations. How many iterations you have to run? You can set it whatever you want. Let's set it to, such as 3, 5, 10. We run more iterations. But the disadvantage of running more iterations is, you may be out of bounds accidentally. It is possible to accidentally run out of this square range. What should we do after it runs out of the square range? It's very simple. We pull it back, and it's over. Just look at it here. If this blue dot is updated and later, it runs out of this square. You look at these four corners. Which corner is closest to the blue point? Just choose that corner. And it's over. Okay, this is an iterative FGSM. It can help you pass the medium baseline. Okay, let's stop here. Because it's half past five. Maybe we should stop now. Let's end the class first. If you have a problem, you can still stay and ask. We can go outside to discuss it. Okay, class dismiss.